Dr. DeSosa has an incredible background focused on building equitable and excellent schools. He has spent the past 22 years as a teacher, school leader, leadership coach, and community organizer, an executive leader, and researcher. We're thrilled to have him join us here today to address the concerns many of our parents here and in the broader SFUSD community have been raising regarding math instruction at SFUSD. So thank you and Dr. DeSouza, please. Thank you, Yvette. Y'all, yeah, I've been like, what can I do in 40 minutes? That will be meaningful. So I got like five hours of planning but we're only gonna do 40 minutes. So hopefully you can be with me and we can have a meaningful conversation about our children. Um, and so just a little bit about me. I'm gonna let you know about me. I'm hoping you can tell me about you because I don't know any of you. I barely know Yvette, I met you today. Tomio, we met twice. Um, if you can get in the chat and just your name, maybe say a little bit about your family. Like, why did you show up today? Um, a little bit about how you're feeling. Scale of one to four, one, really frustrated for being happy, like really happy how things are going. I'd love to see who's in the room because um, I'm gonna try to do my best to, to meet your needs today, but also like in the trajectory of where you guys go with this work, okay? So I'm gonna try to keep my eyes in the chat, see what's going on. Thank you, Vicky. Vicky's frustrated, she said number one. What else we got? I'm gonna introduce myself while you guys are in the chat. Um, so my name is Michael. I am the son of Jose Antonio and Gisela Paz. They moved to the city, San Francisco. Um, my mom came first. My dad came after around in the early 60s. Um, they eventually moved to Livermore and they ran a dry cleaners, which was amazing. They had a third grade education, but they were amazingly uh, successful. And in many ways, I am the manifestation of their dreams. Um, they only went to third grade but I was able to go to college and earn my degree in molecular biology at Cal. Then she got a master's in education at Cal and then eventually went on to get my dissertation and my doctorate done at Cal State East Bay, which is why Yvette's using doctor. I'm still not used to it, but it's good. Um, that's me. I'm also a father. Everything I do, I think changed drastically as soon as I had my first daughter. Uh, there's Rosa, you see her holding her brothers. Um, I have Rosa who's in seventh grade. Joseph, who's in second, uh, seventh grade, second grade, and then my baby, uh, little Jaden, just amazing. Um, he just left me a few minutes ago. So that's why I do this work, um, because I was the first in my family. I definitely don't want to be the last in my family, but I know that my story is actually pretty exceptional, that for every story of first-generation success, there are hundreds and thousands of children who never make it to college. Um, so I'm committed to doing something about that, and so that's what I spent my life doing. Um, so real quick, here's the three schools I worked at. Um, because of my work at these three schools, I feel very, very confident that we can build schools that hold equity and excellence at the same time. I know it. I've seen it. Um, it's possible. Um, in each of these schools, we were able to, to get recognition for doing really amazing things. The state paid me at Alameda or paid our school to disseminate our practices. Um, we had Michael Krasny come to my school when I was in San Jose to talk about first generation college success. That was awesome. It was such an amazing day. Um, and at my school in Hayward, we were tons of awards for serving uh, first generation low income students. Um, so I know it's possible. And so my biggest provocation for today is, is for you all to, to recognize when, you, when you're getting trapped into pitting excellence versus equity. Um, I think this is really common right now in the political discourse in education that we sometimes talk about um, equity means that you're going to lower excellence or reduce rigor. Um, and I know we could do it. Um, and so hopefully we could have that conversation today. Um, so the goals for my time with you all, I'm going to try to not talk too fast. It's good there's no there's no translators today. Um, because we usually when there's a translator and I'm running full speed, they're like, slow down, Michael. Um, so my goals for today are to really have you all reflect on how you want to lead through this moment, because I know a lot of you don't feel comfortable with what's going on for your children in math. Um, and so your leadership is really important and how we lead as families is really important. Um, I'm hoping that we can close with you all having a conversation uh, with each other about what should be the short and long-term goals for SF parents and where you want to take the work with math. Um, and then potentially sharing your ideas on specific next steps for your work in math, okay? So I'm gonna keep the conversation moving. Um, please get in the chat if you can. Um, I'm gonna offer some frames for the conversation today. Um, let me share my screen. Almost there, there we go. So um, 
like I said before, often when we're having conversations about math um, right now, there's there's almost like a war. There's like a math war. We talked about reading words from now. There's a math war, um, and there's the and so we want to try to come out of today being able to embrace complexity and recognizing there's no good guys and bad guys, and there's no 100% right or 100% wrong. That there's a lot of shades of gray, and the way you guys move the work forward is probably by being able to balance that complexity. Um, and so I'm going to offer some frames for you guys to think about how to cha make change happen in complex systems. Um, I think the policy that happened in SF in 2015 when they changed the core sequence was in some ways an example of how not to make change happen. Um, and there's a lot of things that have happened in San Francisco in the last several years that probably not the best way to make change. And so you all can help make change in a way that's more sustaining and really equitable and still leads to excellence. Um, and so I'm also going to offer you some promising practices in mathematics and change um, from my own personal experiences as a school leader and as a community organizer. Okay, so those are the frames I'm going to offer. Um, big, big picture idea. Can someone read this out loud for me? Can y'all see this, this quote? Yeah. Yvette, you want to read it? I saw you nod. Absolutely. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Paul Batlin. Yeah. So we, we're talking about making massive changes in the city um, if we want every child to learn math requires major systemic changes. And so if we recognize that we're getting the results that the system is designed for, then we really need to recognize the, change, the type of change we need to create is systemic. Uh, just changing the core sequence didn't lead to equity and returning the core sequence back to what it was won't lead to equity or excellence either. That there's systemic long-term sustaining work that needs to be done. Um, and so here are three things that I offer as context that I think we have to recognize. Um, and if we can't recognize these things, um, it, my, my my presumptions start here, that if you look at the history of schooling in the United States, that it has, for since its inception, methodically reproduced social hierarchy and racialized outcomes. Um, there are ex exceptions to the rules here and there, but pretty methodically, schools have done this, and there's plenty of research to show that. Um, and unfortunately, the history of school reform has not yielded consistent and sustaining results to address those issues, that we're still trying to figure it out. Um, once again, there's individual schools that do good things, individual classrooms, um, but you can't point, put your finger on a school, school system in America and say, man, they've really knocked it out the park. They've closed all equity gaps and everyone's learning at high levels. But there's a lot of work to do still. Um, and then lastly, to end on a positive note, um, in the last few years, there are several examples of family partnerships and family power and family capacity building as being a uh, igniter for change, uh, for positive change. Um, but after being a principal, I was a school leadership coach. And after that, I was the chief program officer at the Oakland Reach. And I have lots of stories to tell you about what happens when families are really um, seen as partners and experts in moving things. And so we're going to end there um, this session today. So any reactions or thoughts about these contextual uh, realities that we're, that we're dealing with? Feel free to get in the chat if you want to. I see people get in the chat. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> So I offer these because anything that we're going to do, we have to recognize that the historical, social, and political context of San Francisco is very unique. I live in Oakland. So in some ways, our political dynamic in Oakland is not that much different. Um, we, we are historically a city that's very progressive, very left-leaning, very radical, similar in San Francisco in many ways. I consider myself very uh, progressive and radical. And I also consider myself someone who really believes in instructional quality and academic excellence, um, that I hold both those tensions and that I have to understand where we are and where we want to go to, to be an effective leader. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here. Some of y'all might know this stuff. Awesome. You can add more of your wisdom yeah. into the chat. Um, but 10 years ago, 15 years ago, before Common Core, we had traditional math. Um, people thought that the, yeah. it wasn't going to prepare our kids for college. And so um, mm -hmm. a lot of our standards weren't going to prepare our students for the real world. And so common core transition happened, right? And some people started developing curriculum and approaches that, that people have now named like reform math, right? Mm -hmm. the, the war in some ways is between what people, uh, some people describe as traditional math versus reform math. Um, there are a lot of articles written from proponents who think we should go back to more traditional frames of math 
And there are tons of articles for people who are writing about why we should be doing math differently. Um, if you know these, great. If you don't, let me give a quick introduction to how these might be different. Um, this, this, does this look common to anyone? Has anyone seen their kids trying to do math like this in elementary school? Yeah, so this is how, on the left side, that's how I was taught math in my schools, right? Carry the one, keep things lined up, um, procedures, right? And on the right side, it's like a visual representation of multiplication using the area model, right? Um, this is kind of, just do a Google search, Common Core, super easy to find, right? So this is one of the shifts is that they thought that students should be able to understand mathematics on a more conceptual level. Um, during this time, there was also a push in reform math to like kind of move away from math being about lectures, just modeling a procedure to a student, having them practice and then them doing problems. That frame of I do, we do, you do. Have you guys heard of that before? That's been a history of education is showing people how to do something, having them practice how to do it until they master it or direct instruction or explicit instruction. The opposite end, or I'm gonna try not to say opposite, but a lot of people say, well, we should having young people doing more inquiry, more discourse, having conversations about math, that that will help them be better mathematicians. That these things have been pitted as, as antitheses of each other. And what I would say is they're not, that, that both are very important and necessary. Um, people who, who advocate for traditional math may say that being able to make calculations and be fluent with mathematics and, and be able to know your times tables quickly are important and getting the right answer is important. This is my daughter, she really likes answers. Um, she, she was like, I just wanna know the answer. I don't wanna do all this stuff. Um, so there's that frame of thinking about mathematics, which is more aligned to traditional math. Um, and then there's people like, I don't, the answer is not as important. I'm gonna wanna hear more about how are kids thinking about math? How can they conceptualize math, right? So these are these tensions and I'm inviting us to not think that either one is right or wrong, that, and I would say, in my experience, both are very necessary, okay? That students need to both be able to calculate and be fluid with numbers and basic operations. And I want my children to be able to conceptually understand math because there's a lot of advantage to that, which will be another session we do in the future. Um, so another kind of simple, just framing traditional math, we got skills, we're gonna just build up on them over time. It's a linear track of, of courses and knowledge right? Common Core asks us to continue to practice skills over and over again so that we keep on getting better at big ideas and big ways of thinking about math, right? Including speaking about math. Um, so all this stuff was happening, changing from tradition to, to something different, and college admissions and pedagogy have not changed at all during this entire 20-year time of transition. Um, there's still the same college admissions. The same courses are required uh, for students in college. Um, the pedagogy of the university has not changed at all. Um, this is P Mental Hall. I took a lot of classes in this hall, uh, organic chemistry, uh, general chem back at Cal, enormous classroom. Um, pedagogy hasn't changed. Most college classrooms are still direct instruction and lecture. So we have this massive changes, but the system around our children, the system that they will go into after they're done, hasn't changed. And so that creates some tension and problems. Um, Y'all hear what I'm saying? They ain't teaching Common Core at Cal. <laughs> They're teaching from the same textbook they've been teaching for 20 years, right? Um, the other tension in math changes is the reality that we want to make sure that every child has access to STEM careers, right? Which means like being able to take out AP calculus potentially before you graduate. Um, that's what tradition is. That's the path for you to become a mathematician, an engineer, a computer scientist. And we haven't really historically ever talked about, well, what would be the math pathway for someone who goes into the social sciences, right? So Common Core said, hey, we should be doing more statistics, more things where students could potentially use math in the social sciences. Um, and other, other thing with Common Core, people were advocating, well, well, how about math for just everyday life, like looking at things around you and understanding math, right? So these, this is the kind of how we got to where we are. And you can see these different opinions and these tensions of the system of college and reality all coming and banging up next to each other. Does that make sense? Um, so with all this, there's a deep sense of urgency. We gotta do something. Kids are not doing well in math. The, the standards changed. We, uh, families started getting frustrated. Teachers are frustrated. The scores are not as what they want them to be. And so everyone starts coming in with, well, I have the answer. I know what to do. Me and my experts, we're gonna create a plan and impose it upon people because we are experts. Um, and so I see this is the other problem that we've seen with what happens with mathematics is that there's a lot of interest in people thinking they know what's best for other people's children. Um, sometimes parents 
think they know what's best for other people's children, sometimes researchers, sometimes teachers. Um, and so all this comes together in, um, in this phrase that I use very often. And I worry that sometimes people are more interested in being right than they are in doing right. And I think in this current moment in education, in this current moment in math, I see this a lot on both ends of the political spectrum. Um, that if we want to move math instruction in San Francisco, we have to care equally or probably more so about doing right than we do about being right. Um, and so I'm encouraging us as we think about reflecting on our leadership in this moment as individuals and as an like organization of how you guys can do right more than worrying about being right. Um, and really thinking about the, the, the way that means that we have to disrupt the ways of leading. Yeah, Scott found some funny memes. Yeah, we don't need this anymore. We don't need this kind of political discourse. Not helpful. We don't need to attack each other. Man, I've been attacked. I've seen people I love and care for have been attacked on both ends of the political uh, stream. And, and, and I'm so excited about the way that you guys have been leading and that you can lead and really holding all these things at once. Because um, when we don't do it right, the only one that gets hurt are our children. If we just keep on fighting and going back and forth and the pendulum swings left to right, in the meantime, students are the ones who are not getting served. Um, love this, this African proverb. I've used it many times. So <clears throat> I'm going to close this first thing around leadership, just really thinking about how, when we think about what's next for you all in math to kind of just disrupt that this, the idea that there's either one way or one right way, um, that it's those, those people who are, who are bad and evil and have all the wrong ideas. And there's us who have all the right ideas, um, catch yourselves, catch each other. When we do that, it's not going to get us to where we need to go. Um, and how can we embrace this idea that both things can be true, that yes, children deserve direct instruction and systematic instruction, and they benefit from inquiry and conversation about mathematics, that both can be true. Um, so this is the history. This is us thinking about leadership, how we want to show up. And now we're going to use San Francisco Unified as a specific example. In 2015, there was board policy passed. Um, some of you maybe had children already at that time. I know some people may already have grandchildren at that time. Who knows? But there's a massive tra there's a tracking system, and that tracking system led to significant segregation in what what sort of students were in advanced mathematics, and we had persistent inequality in in, in student outcomes, right? And so the board passed a policy that made a massive change in course sequence. How many people knew, know this? I'm assuming most of y'all know this. Five, like I know this. One, like, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know about that. Yeah, so they made a massive change to this. So if you've gone to SFUSD math, you'll see this whole page. Um, and, they, and essentially they said, there's no more algebra in eighth grade, right? No one can take algebra. We're all gonna do sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math. Everyone will take algebra in their first year of high school. And if they wanted an accelerated path, they need to wait till their junior year and take what's, con what's called a cons compressed class, okay? That was their solution to this. And their solution to tracking and segregation and inequality and outcomes was to change course sequence. And I'm, let me say like, it wasn't just this. They, they invested deeply in curriculum development. They had a team of teachers build their own curriculum. Um, they did a lot of work. Um, but I, I think we can all say, looking back to 2015, that the course sequence did not, necessarily address these issues um that we didn't get to a greater sense of excellence or equity during this time in fact we probably have taken some steps backwards um and so i'm gonna offer you guys some considerations around if we want excellence and equity in san francisco unified we really need to be thinking about the changes that have been made and the changes that need to be made and the changes that need to be made to improve san francisco unified will not just rely upon policies structures and systems although those are really important we do need to have some good systems and operations and, and plans in place to move towards equity and excellence in our schools. Um, so some examples of how to do that would be, did they do any work around preparing students, the young kids, so by the time they got to middle school that they all could actually take really rigorous math? What was the plan to do that, right? So there's an area of work that we can be doing to really focusing on students in the young grades to make sure they are ready for middle school. That's, that would be a technical shift that they could have made. They could have really thought about what curriculum they're using and to what degree it pro has proven results, how they're using data and assessments to drive instruction to make sure students aren't falling behind. That would have been a great technical shift as well. Um, they could have thought about what is, what is, how do we teach in this city? Like, how do we use time? Um, do we use block scheduling so we can have kids take two courses in one year? Or how are we thinking creatively about time and calendars and schedules? 
Um, in my schools, we did not have 30 kids learn all the same thing at the same time, especially in ninth grade, because we wanted to accelerate learning. So we did all kinds of interesting instructional models with small group instruction, um, independent learning, group learning, uh, all kinds of interesting instructional model decisions were made. We could have done that too. Uh, we could have really made sure we had a strong, strong plan to teach teachers how to be just baller math teachers, like really good at teaching math. Um, could have really thought about what professional development looked like, what coaching looked like. Um, and this last one, um, we could have really spent a lot of time thinking about how we're going to recruit, retain, and develop and assign teachers in mathematics. And this, to be honest, this is the biggest fire right now, one of the biggest fires we face in education. Um, there's a huge teacher shortage. Um, historically, advanced classes usually get the most experienced teachers. Um, math is probably where I've had to make the most compromises as a principal in terms of hiring people that don't deserve to be in front of our kids. Um, that this is this is a serious issue, right? So I would I would argue and must most, most priority is like we got to recruit great teachers and develop a pipeline for teachers that look like our kids um, and that are great at teaching. Um, so these are all technical solutions to the problem. But any change that needs to be sustained and needs to be equal actually requires a whole other area of work that San Francisco hasn't done yet, which is really thinking about like, how do people relate to the change? What, how, how do they think about what they need to happen? Who's involved? How do our identities matter in this moment? And what information is being collected from families and going out to families? Um, I often call this type of work around what knowledge we need to develop, what skills do we need to develop, what mindsets do we need to have, and what is the will of the people? What are the will of families and teachers and the folks in the community? I don't think they did much of this below the, the, this green line. They didn't do this work. And so here we are with people angry, teachers angry, families angry, things not going well. Um, and so changing complex systems requires us to really think about all these things, um, to embrace complexity in our leadership and the way we solve problems. Um, to really think about both the technical and adaptive work that needs to happen in changing complex systems. Um, and what are the promising practices? Um, I'm going to offer some promising practices, and then you guys are going to have another conversation with each other. Um, skipping through, I'm looking at time. See, I said I planned about five hours. Um, so I want to give you guys a few examples of things that worked for me when I was at the Oakland Reach. Has anyone heard about the Oakland Reach? Have you guys heard of that? No, the Oakland Reach is a parent-led group in Oakland, California, uh, who first did parent advocacy, but eventually we actually end up becoming an uh, educational service provider. Um, at the Oakland Reach during COVID, we taught kids how to read. We hired a team of women who uh, were really good at teaching kids how to read. And then we expanded from seven tutors to 20 tutors to eventually now all Oakland Unified Schools have community literacy teachers in their school, in their classrooms. Um, and the Oakland Reach is recruiting and training all these families to become literacy teachers. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because family said, hey, there's a problem with reading. We ran a campaign to make sure that the district moved towards a, a systematic approach to literacy instruction in early grades. And then COVID happened and none of that was going to happen. And so instead, we just started teaching kids how to read. And we proved to them that we can teach kids how to read. And we started with a pilot and it grew to where it is now. So I, I, I offer this as an example of how do you start small? How do you pick a, a thing that you really care about, pilot something on a small scale, prove that it works, and then grow? So that's one way you all can think about how we address math in San Francisco Unified, is if we just go back and say, okay, algebra one, eighth grade, we put it on, then what? Who's teaching it? What curriculum are they using? How is it going to get us better to where we were before we made the curricular change? Just going back to where things were might help some students, right? Will help probably daughter, like my daughter. Because, you know, my daughter is going to take Algebra 1 next year. She's going to go in eighth grade. Uh, her school offers an online option. So she'll do a math eight and an online option at the same time. Not ideal, but she has that option. Um, but there's so much more that her schools need to do to make sure kids like her can be served and kids who are not at grade level can get served. So... I offer the Oakland Reach as an example of starting small, finding a problem, creating a campaign, and putting families in the seat to make change. And you all as parents can really figure out how to move things with people and not for people. We're not doing things to people. Um, second, I hope that the San Francisco Unified moves towards a data-driven, systematic, and structured approach to mathematics with potential opportunities to really think about how you use personalization, where students who need more get more. P students who can go faster can go faster. There's not a lot of that happening in a lot of our schools. Um, and lastly, really thinking about like, how can you guys learn about how to use scheduling and instructional models in, in an innovative way 
going away from this 30 kids, one classroom, one teacher for 50 minutes at a time, I'm really thinking about how scheduling can be used to, to accelerate learning.